Thank you. Thanks very much. Good evening. Um, my name is Bob. I, uh, uh, when they first asked me, Ash and all the people here, to give a talk about lessons learned, I, I took a full inventory of my very favorite horrifying screw-ups of the course of my life. And um, I'm happy to tell you that I've lived long enough that um, I have a nice list to choose from. Uh, my favorite little tidbit is that I have lost on Jeopardy more often than anyone alive. <laughs> that is actually true. You can Google that. Um, I, uh, I've been on the show 14 times, including some invitational tournaments. And yeah, well, someone has to lose to Ken. And uh, <laughs> I have so far not won a total of $4.1 million. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not bitter at all. So. Um, but I did win some money. I did pretty well on the show. And that changed my situation financially, which was neat. And I've had a lot of other really good fortune. I got to be a luxury travel writer, even though my clothes don't fit. And I, I, I really, I've had a really lucky life. Plus, let's face it, all the privilege, all of the privilege is right here. And so at some point in your life, you want to just, you know, do something charitable, do something good with your life. And I don't think I'm alone in that. I'm sure every single person in here in the same set of situations, you know, would, would do the same thing. Um, is there anybody in here who doesn't want to make the world a better place? Just show your hand. <laughs> We're at a TED event. You're in the wrong room entirely. If that's the... So uh, I, I, and you know, it, I didn't want to just give money or something like that. I wanted to get my hands dirty, jump in, do some, you know, big, uh, big project. Um, uh, and, and not just out of like a charitable impulse, out of generosity. I mean, I, I have some, I'll own that, but there was also some real selfishness involved, to be honest. Um, I, I wanted to do something good, there was that. And there's also, you know, you hear like people's lives being changed and transformed by their charity work, by their volunteer work. You hear the stories of people's lives gaining meaning and purpose and, you know, oh, give me some of that. That sounds fun. I want that. So I decided I'd find something. And have you ever like, been at a party and there'll be somebody who's so like thrilled with their volunteer work that they, 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 they wind up saying things that don't even make sense at first out of context? Like, I just got back from Haiti and it was awesome. <laughs> and my first thought, if you're like me, is like, really? Because I doesn't look awesome. Maybe volunteering is that great. Okay, so I'll try it. And I'm a writer, so I, I decided to do a book project, which Chris briefly mentioned. Um, I took my nest egg, and I invested it in small businesses around the world. Uh, uh, there's people who live on three or four dollars a day, shopkeepers and grocers, farmers, uh, craftspeople, and so on. Of, if you're a fisherman with a rowboat and it brings a leak, you can't go to Citibank for a bridge loan. You need small capital. You need people like you and me to invest and help out. And so there's this thing called microlending and a charity platform called Kiva.org that makes it possible for anyone to put a little bit of money in and help people build their businesses all over the world. So I thought, okay, let's find out whether this works. I'll take my nest egg. And I put, I made thousands of loans through Kiva out to their field partners and then in 80 some odd countries around the world. And for my book project, I followed the money. I went to Kiva, and then I went to field partners on five continents, and then I found the, uh, the, the loan officers, and ultimately found clients themselves who I'd previously only seen in my laptop as, you know, click, send, money, good, yay. And I got to show up on their doorstep and actually say, hi, uh, my name's Bob, I'm from Los Angeles, and I've come to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, to <laughs> ask you how your woodworking business is going, hi. <laughs> I did that on five continents for years. And generally speaking, and by the way, I never told them I was a lender because that would be really gross. Uh, you know, that'd create this nasty indebtedness Tony Soprano vibe that I'd want to, you know, <laughs> I hope you like the cow I helped you buy. I didn't want to do that. So I would just show up with a translator and generally speaking, whether it was Peru or Kenya, they would look at me and they'd kind of turn their head a little and then they'd look at the translator like, is he for real? And the translator would be like that. And, <laughs> That's a universal body language, by the way. And, but in 10 minutes, I would be meeting them and getting to know them. Even in places that I was a little afraid of, I was welcomed like an old friend everywhere I went. And my God, it was, it was awesome. I got to meet, the, 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 here's the truth. I've been to 81 countries so far. And whether you're Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Muslim, whatever, the one universal truth I've seen every single place I've been is that everybody just wants a better life for their kids. We have a bazillion disagreements about how, obviously, but that is a true thing. That is a human dream. And if you connect on that level with people, magic happens, magic. People start opening up to you, and I saw, in places where people make three bucks a day, 
creativity and hope because they love their children and a work ethic and resilience, people who'd been through wars. I saw welcomes everywhere and it didn't matter where I was, even in places I was honestly a little afraid to go. And so I learned that microfinance actually does work pretty well when it's properly administered like any human construction. I learned that people are freaking awesome and I have a sense of connection that I never dreamed of. And my own life, it got awesome, usually. Only usually, and this is the part that's the catch. Um, the thing is, in, in, and, and this needs to be talked about, in, in, if you do volunteer work or whatever, what I did is, for my book, I wanted to see microfinance in its most challenging environments. So I went to Beirut, and I showed up. Hi, how's it going? How's it going in Beirut? And I heard their stories, and they've been through some stuff. I went to Rwanda, and I sat with people who'd survived the genocide, and I heard their stories with empathy. And I heard the stories, I could go on and on. Uh, 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 Cambodia, I went to Phnom Penh and Siem Reap, and I, I heard stories of people who survived the, the Khmer Rouge, uh, uh, Sarajevo, people who survived the siege, and so on. And so I was hearing these stories with empathy, and, and I'm eager to write them because I want everyone to feel what I got to feel. Um, and holding these stories for years as I was working on the book, I didn't realize that I was actually giving myself an atrocity world tour as I was getting to see all of this. So I came home with mission. I had purpose. I'm going to write this book, and it's going to help these people. And I wrote, and I wrote, and I actually am really proud of the book that I wrote. And I banged that thing out, and I was expecting to feel super proud. And I hit that, and I hit send on that thing, and I sent it off to the publisher. And an interesting thing happened. I was proud for about six hours. And all of the stories that I've been holding here, finally, I didn't need to think about them anymore. They all came here. And about six hours later, I was running errands through Los Angeles, just driving, and all of a sudden, I started weeping. My whole body, just shaking. I couldn't stop it. I didn't know what was going on. I figured, you know, okay, it's postpartum. Every big project, there's a period of grief that you're done. That's true. Uh, maybe I'm just tired. I worked really hard. I'll get some rest. And the next day, and then the next, were hard. And I didn't know what was happening to me. And I was thinking, well, I'll get through it. I'll just power through it. I'm strong. I'll just power through it. It'll be fine. And it didn't get better. Uh, I started having nightmares. I missed sleep. Uh, I started seeing stories that I'd heard, uh, things that weren't even in the book. Uh, that I, I, I can't watch Game of Thrones, let's say that. Um, that's really true, I can't watch Game of Thrones. Because stuff like that happens, and I'd met people who had family. And I was really starting to, and I was wondering, God, what's wrong with me? Because these people had all survived these things, and they're okay. And I just heard the stories, and I'm falling apart. What, am I weak? What, what's happening? And, and while this is going on, I started drinking. Uh, a doctor put me on anti-anxiety medications, which I do not recommend. And then the book comes out, and I've got to do TV and radio. So I'm going out. But, you know, and, I, and I enjoyed those things, because I got to tell the true story of the brilliant, creative people that I met in what seemed to me previously unlikely places. Uh, so that was fun, and I had hope. And then I'd still go back to the hotel, and I would drink, or I would cry. And I did not know what was happening to me. Until, and this is part of what I came here to tell you, a counselor told me about a thing called secondary PTSD. Now, it should make total sense what that is at this point, and human beings are silly putty. Of course that exists. Of course it's a thing. If you're an empathetic, look, if I put a big picture of a cute kitty up on the screen, 300 people would go, aww. It's just, it's how we are, right? Or if I showed you romance with the heart and people holding their hands, you'd have your romantic memories. And if I showed you uh, something horrible from a war zone, you'd all feel horror. Of course you would. So naturally, if you spend a lot of time working with uh, people who are under stress or, or have suffered trauma, you may start absorbing some of it. And if you haven't had training, and, I'll, and people don't talk about this. I've almost never met anybody who even knows what this is then it can hit you and you don't know what it is. So one of the reasons I wanted to come here was to talk about this, not just for you guys, but also to put it up on the internet. Because there are people out there suffering right now. If you are a military spouse, if you are a first responder, an EMT who sees this every day, if, if you're someone from an, a, a, a community that suffered from an active shooter or a, uh, a hurricane or any kind of disaster, or even if you're a professional counselor who works with victims of trauma and abuse and you haven't set your life up perfectly, you may be hurting now in a way that you weren't expecting to hurt. And there's nothing wrong with you. You just took on a really hard job. There's counseling to be done. You can, it's fine. Just go get help, you'll be okay. So that needs to be said. Now, for everybody else in here, you might be thinking to yourself, well, thanks for sharing, Bob. Uh, now I never want to do anything nice for anyone. 
as long as I live. That sounds like hell. No, that's exactly the wrong message. Actually, you should come out, walk out of here feeling incredibly empowered. You should feel bold and eager to go change the world. I asked you earlier, hey, did anybody here not want to change the world? And of course, everybody does. Well, what's stopping you? Fear. You can sense, we intuit that anytime we connect to another human being, we may be changed in the transaction. And if you're working with somebody, you're trying to help something or do something, that's scary. It gets you out of your comfort zone and you may feel some of it. We intuit this. It's part of why we don't do it. And what I'm trying to give you is what it looks like in your worst case scenario. Some untrained lunatic, I'll own it, goes and sits under a tree in Rwanda and hears stories and then goes to the next town and the next village, the next country and does this for years. And I came home and I had a couple of crappy months. So what? That's fine. Uh, and by the way, I wouldn't trade one second of any of it, good and bad, because in addition to every single memory that I struggle with periodically, I also have a thousand others that give me hope in a way that I wish I had hours to share with you. Um, I have a faith in humanity now that I would never have had otherwise. Uh, so when there's something that you want to do in the world, and there will be something, whatever it is, you're probably not going to Rwanda, uh, I don't know what it is that you are passionate about, but I don't, if you're doing Meals on Wheels, you can do Meals on Wheels, go. It's not gonna be that bad. When you feel that fear of this is gonna be different, this is gonna be changed, this is gonna be challenging, that fear is a gateway to the world you want to make, to the change in other people to help you wanna give. And I've gone through that. And if I have anything I can urge on you from an unexpected set of experiences that be bold, in your generosity. Be brave. Love people you don't even know. Because you know what happens? It's awesome. And usually. And when it's not, that's okay too. Thanks.